The noir maverick with the whispering gaze that we're looking at today is the legendary Robert Mitchum. An acknowledgement to Mitchum. The dark hallways of cinema noir where Robert Mitchum appears as a brooding figure, his whispering stare and nonchalant demeanour leave an indelible stamp on the genre, and he's a figure that will be remembered forever. His journey through Hollywood's noir landscape is a story of subtle intensity and uncompromising individualism. Robert Mitchum was born in 1917, and his path in Hollywood includes many films. The purpose of this piece is to investigate his life, illuminate the multifaceted characters that he brought to life in the noir genre, an enduring imprint that he left on the murky realms of cinematic narrative. The early lives of Mitchum were filled with a variety of exciting adventures that served as the basis for the laid-back attitude that he would later build on in screen. He developed the resiliency that would come to define his representations of noir characters as a result of his upbringing during the Great Depression, which allowed him to handle the hardships of youth that was constantly moving around. A path that began with Mitchum playing little parts and ended up with him becoming one of the most iconic leading men in Hollywood. And it began with his admission into the acting world, which was as modest as future performances. Cool confidence as a new look. Mitchum became the personification of calm assurance that is characteristic of the film noir genre as the noir genre entered its prime. The film Out of the Past in 1947, directed by Jacques Tournier, was the film that brought him to prominence because it demonstrated his ability to portray a sense of moral ambiguity and fatalism. The role that Mitchum played as Jeff Bailey, a private investigator who becomes embroiled in a web of deceit and desire, laid the groundwork for his subsequent success in the noir genre. Mitchum's adaptability within noir and the environment was illustrated in the film Crossfire in 1947, in which he played supporting character about a soldier who was involved in a murder investigation. The depth of the character that he brought to noir storytelling was evidenced by the fact that he was able to portray both a sense of threat and also vulnerability. It was Mitchum's work with directors like Howard Hawks in films like The Big Steel in 1949 and His Kind of Woman in 1951 that brought out his magnetic presence on the screen. When Mitchum was paired with leading ladies such as Jane Russell, and Jane Greer, the chemistry between them led an additional dimension of intrigue to the noir characters. It was his nonchalant manner and seemingly effortless coolness that became synonymous with the noir image. Off screen, Mitchum's lifestyle mirrored the laid back nonchalance of his roles, which soon became apparent beyond the confines of the silver screen. He frequently minimized his own acting ability despite the fact that he was well known for his disdain for Hollywood pretense. Mitchum's personal life was defined by legal issues, included a well-published marijuana arrest, which added a layer of real-world drama to his existence, which was reminiscent of a noir film. This was despite the fact that Mitchum appeared to be confident on screen. He's the reluctant hero of both legacy and noir. Mitchum's career varied during the 1950s, but the influence of his parts in noir films continued to be enormous. This occurred as the noir era was coming to an end. Within the genre, his portrayal of the reluctant hero, a man caught in the cross-currents of fate and moral ambiguity, has left an enduring legacy that will be remembered for a long time. He's one of my favourite actors of all time. His capacity to develop whilst preserving the noir sensibility was well demonstrated in films such as the legendary Cape Fear in 1962, in which Mitchum played the role of the frightening Max Cady. 
This film was then remade later on, with Mitchum's role being reprised by the legendary Robert De Niro. Closing bow. 1997 was the year that Mitchum's career came to an end, marking the conclusion of a career that spanned several decades. On the other hand, his legacy lives on in the echoes of the noir roles that he portrays. The characters created by Mitchum continue to captivate audiences and redefine the boundaries of storytelling in noir, whether they're traversing the perilous roads of criminality or battling their own personal demons. In conclusion, Robert Mitchum's trip through the terrain of the noir genre is a symphony of subtle intensity. He was a maverick who personified the cool assurance that is charismatic of the genre. It is the goal of the documentary, this one, that we've done today, to shed the light on the complex aspects of his cinematic luminance. We investigate the shadows in which his characters remain and endure influence he left on the gritty world of noir. Mitchum's legacy is a dark, series of performances that continue to resound in the annals of history of cinema. From the smoky alleyways of Out of the Past to the frightening presence of Cape Fear, his legacy is a collection of performances that continue to reverberate. So that's our piece on Robert Mitchum. He's also done some great films that are very underrated. Um, I remember one where he played uh, in a Western. He was in Westerns a lot. And th those films were just incredible. I think I remember him most from those, um, from those films. Um, and he's kind of got a striking presence. Uh, he's been in, in a lot of movies. He received Acad Academy uh, nominations at the Academy Awards and also a BAFTA Award. He's got a, a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Um, he's got a Golden Globe, the Cecil B. DeMille Award in 1992. And he was also rated uh, very highly on AFI's list of greatest American uh, sort of stars of all time as male actors. One of my favorite films is Night of the Hunter where he played this spooky dude who scared a lot of the, 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 the young people in the film. Uh, and also, he did a great film called Ryan's Daughter. Early on in his life, he, uh, he was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1917 in August into mostly a Methodist family. And he descended from various strands of cultures, Norwegian, Irish, Scottish, Native American. His father was a shipyard railroad worker and his mother was a Norwegian immigrant and a captain's daughter of the sea, sea captain. Um, sadly, his father um, was crushed to death in an accident in the railway in 1919 um, and his widow was awarded uh, some money and she took that to Connecticut um, and then moved uh, along to South Carolina. When he was a child, he was a bit of a joker, often involved in fights and in the schoolyard and getting up to no good. Um, and his mother sent him sooner later to live with her parents, his grandparents, on a farm in Delaware. After various adventures in different places, being expelled from in many schools, he moved to the West Coast in the hope of working in movies. Originally working as a ghost writer for somebody else, his mother persuaded him to move into, um, no, I don't think it was his mother. Yes, it was his mother. Was his mother? 
No, it was his sister, that was it. So his older sister persuaded him to join theatre. And soon after, he worked as a bit part actor in some productions, and mostly as a stagehand behind the scenes. After getting married in Delaware, he moved back to California and gave up his art finding some work as a machine operator during World War II. And in this kind of work, working with aircraft, he, he had some damage to his hearing due to the machinery and also had some stress problems. He then moved back into acting and worked with a producer in Paramount and then was hired to play various villainous roles. Another role with Mickey Rooney in a war film, and then his first major film, he came on as a war, war private in Randolph Scott's film, Gung Ho. Supported himself by doing various other extra roles and other, other work. After impressing a few directors, he signed a contract with RKO and then basically worked in various uh, B-movies in Westerns based on the legendary Zane Grey's stories. He rose in a United Artists deal with RKO. He worked for them in a supporting actor role in Story of G.I. Joe in 1945 where he played a war-weary officer. And that sort of stood him out. Soon after, he was drafted into the uh, US Army and served as a medic. And then he kind of moved into film noir. After various successes, he ran into various legal troubles, as I said, due to the marijuana arrest, which caused him some problems. However, his, his success was not harmed by this, and his films were released and to some acclaim. He moved into more mainstream stardom in the 50s and 60s, where he's played various film noir roles. He then played various films, which were noir, westerns, and The Night of the Hunter, which was Charles Lawton, the legendary actor's only film he did as a director, where he starred as a criminal pretending to be a preacher. Some consider this to be his best role. He then did various films for uh, United Artists and then played a great film called Heaven Knows Mr. Allison with Deborah Kerr, which is the legendary John Houston film, where he played uh, a Marine corporal shipwrecked um, on a desert island with a nun played by Deborah Kerr. So it's a war film, not Western, sorry. After various roles in the 50s, he moved on to work on a film called Sundowners, where he was reunited with Kerr, and he played an Australian husband and his wife, played by Kerr, struggling with the uh, industry of the sheep industry in the farms during the Great Depression. These films re received some Oscar nominations, and he received some acclaim for this. But it was the 1962 film where he played Max Cady, the menacing rapist in Cape Fear, 
which has brought him renowned for playing a creepy, predatory character. This led to various other films which were not so great, including Howard Hawks's El Dorado, which is like a remake of Rio Bravo, and a few other World War II films. One of my favourite films of all time, he co-starred with Dean Martin in the 1968 film Western, Five Card Stud, which is actually an incredible film. If you watch it, it's one of my favourites. He then made a move from a typical role to work with David Lean, the legendary director, in a film called Ryan's Daughter, where he played a mild-mannered school master in World War I time Ireland. The film was nominated for various Academy Awards and Mitchum was in the running for Best Actor but he was not actually nominated. However, he moved on in the 70s to more crime drama. It didn't have much success. Playing the aged Philip Marlowe, in one of Raymond Chandler's adaptations, Farewell My Lovely, in 1975, which was well received. He also appeared in the legendary film Midway about the crucial World War II battle with various other stars. In the 80s, he worked on a film which is an adaptation of a Pulitzer Prize winner played the championship season by playwright Jason Miller as Coach Delaney. And he moved more into television work with a miniseries in the 80s, The Winds of War. He was also treated in the 80s for alcoholism, playing various other TV roles, and went on in 1991 to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Board of Review of Motion Pictures. And in 1992, winning the Cecil B. DeMille Award from the Golden Globes. In contrast to his original role as Max Cady, he played the protagonist police detective in Scorsese's remake of Cape Fear, slowing down soon after. As a heavy smoker, Mitchum died in his sleep July 1st, 1997 in California from complications of lung cancer and emphysema. He was cremated and his ashes were scattered into the Pacific Ocean near his home. It was a private ceremony only attended by some few family members and his long-term friend, the legendary actress Jane Russell. So that was, that was just some of the facts for the legendary Robert Mitchum. Go and check out his films. Five Card Stud is a very underrated Western, which is one of my favourites, with Dean Martin. Really enjoyed that. And, yeah, The Legendary Cape Fear and also Night of the Hunter, some great films there for you to go and check out. And some of his lesser-known films, always worth knowing and always worth checking out Legendary Actors' other films. I uh, hope you found that useful. And now we move on to the episode for today. Again. We are focusing on Dragnet, the series with starring Jack Webb as Joe Friday. Today's episode, we are going to be looking at the episode 16 of the original series in 1949, originally screened September the 17th. This episode is called Vickers Cop Killing. And it's all about, uh, basically what happens is one of the officers in, is, is shot and, and wounded. 
And one of the suspects is is apprehended, James Vickers, by Friday in Romero. But the other is still on the run. When the officer dies, things escalate. And the hunt for the other shooter intensifies. Check out this episode with our favourite characters, Ben Romero, Chief of Detectives Egg Backstrand, and Joe Friday, as they work on Homicide Daywatch. This is episode 16 of the original series in 1949 of Dragnet. Originally played September the 17th, 1949. Hope you enjoy this episode. And I'll see you on the other side. Here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. Sergeant, you're assigned to Homicide Bureau. A police officer has been shot, mortally wounded. One of the suspects has been apprehended. The other is still at large. Your job, find him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, November 16th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 11.58 a.m. when we got to the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, second floor, room five. Treatment room. All right, you made a good time. How's them, Mr. Doc? Got in the lungs, Ben, three times. He's going fast. His wife with him? Yeah, they bring him down now. Can we talk to him? Yeah, make it fast. Come on, Joe. Yeah. This way. Easy. John, it's Friday in Romero. I want to talk to you a minute. Oh, Doc. Doc, it burns. My chest. Burning up. Nurse? Yes, Doctor? Are the hypodermic? Uh, yes, Doctor. <laughs> yeah, easy. All right, fellas. Don't take too long. John, it's Joe Friday. Can you tell us how it happened? Joe. Joe. How'd it happen, boy? Can you tell me? Can't figure it, Joe. Why'd he do it? We gotta find out. Now, how'd it happen? I don't know. I was directing traffic. East Broadway and First Street. Gray Coop. Pulled up for the stop. Gray Coop. How many men in the car? How many, John? Two. <coughs> Gray Coop. Pulled up for the stop. In the pedestrian... Pedestrian lane. Went over. Gonna ask him to back up. Back up out of lane. Just gonna ask him. Yeah, John, and then what? Driver. Dark hair. Eyes. Dark. Went well, no, over. Gonna, gonna ask him. Back up. Pointed a gun. No reason. Pointed a gun at me. All right, easy, John. Take it easy. No reason, Joe. No reason he fired. Hurry it up, Joe. Yeah. No. What about the other man in the car? Did you see him? Can you describe him? Joe. Joe, did you get him? Great coupe. Driver. Guy with him. We got the driver, John. He's upstairs. The other one got away. We gotta find him. You gotta help us. My wife. Somebody send for Dora. She's on her way. She'll be here in a minute. Now, can you tell us, the other man in the car, what did he look like? Great Coop. What did he look like? Don't press him, Joe. Great Coop. The driver. Pointed a gun. Dark hair. Yeah, Dark I know the other man, John. We got the driver. What did the other man look like? Send for Dora. Come on, Ben. 
Thanks, Doc. Okay, Joe. You going fast? Yeah. John got any kids? Two. Always pick a family man. This thing's got a phony ring to it, Ben. You don't just pull a gun and shoot a man. Not if you're sane, you don't. There's the stairs. The guy we got is as sane as they come. And how do we explain it? All I know is that hood shot John Bemis, and I want to know why. Mm. Might be a lead in that car he was driving. Maybe. Come on, here we are. Phone message for you, Friday. Came in a few moments ago. Thanks, Davis. It's from R&I. They got a make? Take a look. No make or warrants on James Vickers. Great. Let's talk to him. Come on. Yeah. Minor wound, Joe. Bullet penetrated the fleshy part of his hand. Didn't touch the bone. Thought this guy had an arm wound, too. Just a neck, Ben. That officer you shot, Vickers, he's dying. Is he? He's a family guy. Got a wife, two kids. Has he? Why did you shoot him, Vickers? Ask him. We did. Then you know the reason. Said there wasn't any reason. That's right. Look, we're going to make you on this, Vickers. You know that, don't you? I don't know anything. Why'd you shoot him? Shut up. Why'd you shoot him? Joe. Yeah. Davis? Yeah? Stay with him. Bye. Doc, get us an MT slip on this guy, will you? We'll be back in a minute. Come on, man. All right, Joe. Have it ready. Too big, punk. Easy, Joe. Oh, easy nothing. I've seen too many good cops like Bemis cut down by punks like that Vickers. Getting mad won't hell. Come on, down the stairs. Yeah. Back to see Bemis? Why? Just for the record. I want to see if the doc thinks it's okay for us to bring Vickers down. I'd like to have Bemis definitely identify him as the guy who shot him. We've got three good witnesses. An identification for Bemis will clinch it. I want to see Vickers get everything he's earned when he goes to court. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> and then you went fast, Joe. Yeah. That his wife? Yeah. she make it in time? No. Did he say anything that it'd help? No, it might. He said a prayer. City Hall. Two six two five. Two six two five. Auto records, Crowley. Joe Friday, Vince. What about a make on that car used in the beam of shooting this morning? Yeah, Joe, I've been trying to get a hold of you. Where are you now? Georgia Street, second floor. What about the make? Car was reported stolen yesterday afternoon. Registered to Harold Simpers, 716 Everett Street. Report said the car was taken from a parking lot at Grand and Wabash. Okay, Vince, thanks. What about the guns they found in the car? Lee Jones still has them over at the crime lab. He's running them through. No word yet? No. You make out the impound report on the car, Joe? Yeah, recovery report, too. They're still dusting for print. MT slip ready, Doc? Yeah, right here, Ben. Medical card, history, MT slip. You ready, Vickers? Yeah. All right, put out your wrist. Put the cuffs on him, Ben. Watch his hands. You saving me for the hot lights? All right, let's go. I'm not going to jail. You're in jail now. Looks like a hospital. Bars on the windows, aren't they? All right, come on. Give me a smoke. Here. Okay. Light. What do I get if I open up? No deal. My talk, make it attractive. Who was the other guy in the car? Hitchhike. I always give rides. And why'd he run when we chased you? Maybe he was scared. You're part of a gang. Maybe. Who was the other guy? What's it worth? Oh, come on, Vickers. You're wasting our time. Where are we going? All right. My hand hurts. I want to call my own doctor. You hear me? Yeah. That cop pulled his gun first. I can prove it. Yeah, down the stairs. Easy, huh? Where are we going? I said, where are we going? All right, what's it worth if I talk? I could tell you all about it. Let's make a deal. You'll tell us anyhow. Think so? All right, you, out the door. Uh, wait a minute, huh? Cigarettes out. 
All right, Ben, light it. Yeah. Nice of you guys. Thanks. Oh, oh, get up, Ben. Wait, Vicker, up. stop. He's crossing the street. Fire over his head. Watch the crowd. Vicker! Joe, he's running for that car. All right, let's hold it, Vicker. All right, stop it, Ben. Please stop. Come on, Joe. All right, come on, get back, please. Let us through here. Let us through. Shall I call a doctor, Joe? No, he wouldn't be interested. The guy's dead. James Vickers, murder suspect, address unknown, died almost instantly at 1.13 p.m. November 16th while attempting to escape. His body was taken to the county morgue where it was posted. All the personal effects found on the body were listed by the coroner and a receipt for them given to our office. At 8.35 the next morning, Ben and I met with Chief Detective Zed Backstrand. Those four guns they found in the car Vickers was driving, they're all U.S. Army property. Where were they stolen from, Skipper? I don't know. Each one of the guns is stamped U.S. Army, that's all. Well, that makes it easy. The coroner find anything on the body? Nothing to tell us why Vickers decided to kill a traffic cop. What did Bemis say before he died? He was on traffic duty yesterday morning down at East Broadway and First. At 10.35, a gray coupe pulled up for a stop sign. Vickers was driving. Uh-huh. Bemis started over to tell him to back up out of the pedestrian zone. Vickers pulled a gun and shot him. How'd they catch Vickers? Chased him three miles before he piled into a lumber truck. The guy with him got away. Fine. Checked R and I. No make or warrants on Vickers. Kickback's not in on his fingerprint. All right. What's your guess, Freddy? I don't have one, Ed. Vickers could have been hopped up. Doc Stanley over at Georgia Street said no. We checked him. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Backstrand. Yeah, hold on. For you, Friday. Okay, thanks. Friday talking. Yeah. Yeah, good. Be right over, Lee. We're in business, Ed. Crime Lab just found Vicker's address. <laughs> There it is, Joe. Thanks, Lee. Let's see, huh? Silver Dollar Hotel. Received a Mr. James Vickers, $6.50, room three forty-five. Where'd you find it, Lee? Under the front seat, in with the tools. Anything else? Not a thing. How about prints? Two. Kind of smudged. Hope we can run a make with them. No prints on those four guns, Lee? Smeared. Not enough to classify. Yeah, this is it, Ben. It's all we got. Come on, let's see if we can make it pay off. <laughs> located the Silver Dollar Hotel on East Grand between 16th Street and Pico. It was an old-type frame building with a brightly colored neon sign jutting out over the sidewalk just above the dark entrance. The manager's name was Luther Gage. We showed him a picture of James Vickers. He definitely identified him as one of his former tenants. He told us that Vickers had stayed at the hotel one week in room 345 and that he had checked out two days ago. Was Vickers staying here alone, Miss Gay? Yes, alone. Quiet man. Did he have any visitors? Maybe. Wouldn't know. Paid his bills. Spent most of his time away from the hotel. Good tenant. Did Vickers have any friends here in the hotel? Mm, maybe. Fell in the room next to Mr. Vickers. He still lives here. Two of them used to be kind of thick. Can we look at that room Vickers stayed in, Mr. Gage? Mm, let's see. Yes, it's still vacant. All right. This way. This man Vickers was friendly with. What's his name, Gage? Mm, Knight. Raymond Knight. Room 343. See in his room now? No. Went out about 8 this morning. Here's the elevator. How well would you say Knight and Vickers knew each other? Couldn't say. Good tenants, both of them. Pay their bills. Did they go out together, seem to know each other well? Wouldn't know. I don't pry. Look, this case involves murder, Mr. Gage. We told you that. We'd appreciate your cooperation. Cooperation don't pay the rent, Sergeant. Third floor. This way. Here. Three, four, five. Open it up. Nothing. Yeah, over here. Looks pretty clean, Joe. All my rooms are clean. You didn't mean it that way, Mr. Gage. I wonder if you'd show us Knight's room now. That's next door, isn't it? Hmm, I don't know about this. Poking into other people's rooms. Not regular. Neither's murder. Come on, let's go. Does Mr. Knight have this room to himself? Sure ask questions, don't you? No, Knight has a friend staying with him. About two weeks now. Not in much. Is he in now? Don't think so. Oh, I... Ben, watch it! Oh, drop that, you! Oh, 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 oh. That shot, Mr. Gage, look out! Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Right, come on, get up! Oh. 
Ben? He's out cold. Look what you've done to the room. I thought you said Knight wasn't in. He isn't. This is his friend. Great friends. 45 automatic in his hand. 38 snub nose in the bureau. Another 45. Look in his bag. I don't pry. He pays his bills. Good tenant. Yeah. Can I get outside on this phone? Mm, yes. All outside calls are 10 cents. Yeah. Here. Have to keep the book straight. Sure you do. Who's going to pay for the damage? Ask Mr. Knight's friend here. Well, say... Why worry? He pays his bills. Good tenant. I called Ed Backstrand, and he sent out a special detail to stake out the hotel and bring in Raymond Knight if and when he returned. Ben and I drove to the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital where Doc Stanley patched up the cut on Ben's scalp and treated Raymond Knight's friend for simple cuts and bruises. From papers found in his wallet and in the hotel room, he was identified as Frank Gannon, 9896 Wasatch Street, Kansas City, Missouri. When we got to headquarters, we had Gannon taken to the interrogation room where we questioned him briefly. He told us that he was a self-employed watch salesman, that he was in the city on a business trip. He admitted friendship with Knight, but not with Vickers. We booked him at the county jail for assault with intent to commit murder. The three guns found in the hotel room were turned over to the crime lab. We reported back to the office. Show my head's pounding like mad. That Gannon's a mean. Yeah, it's a nasty crack. I got some aspirin in my desk. Might help. Here are. Hi, boys. Rough day. I don't get much rough already. Message for you on the desk. I'm gonna eat. Starving. Right, Tracy. What is it, Joe? Well, Jones got a make on those prints he lifted off the car. Let's see. Yeah, something else in now on James Baker. Uh-huh. Wanted 10 14 43, desertion, U.S. Army. That could account for those stolen army guns. Yeah. What about the make on those prints Lee found? Let's take a look. Vance Taylor's. Good solid record. Four burglaries, two armed robberies, two assaults. Wait a minute. Here's the mama sheet. Mm -hmm. All right. Born so and so, age 36. I'd... Alias John Fields, Harold Grant, Tom Bissell, jo Hey. Yeah, alias Raymond Knight. The other man who rode in the car with James Vickers the morning he shot down traffic officer Bemis finally had been identified. Vance Taylor, alias Raymond Knight. Well, that still didn't explain the unprovoked murder. It didn't explain the four guns found in the car or the three guns found in the hotel room. An assortment of arms like that could mean something big, but we didn't know what. Gannon's sudden willingness to shoot it out in the hotel room meant something, too, but we didn't know what. We had Gannon brought back to the interrogation room. Hi, Gannon. Have a seat. Everything all right? I'll bet you're worried. No, we're not worried, Gannon. You ought to be. Don't make me laugh. You're tied in with Raymond Knight. That's enough for us. You send me up for it. We're going to try. Big talk. How long did you know Vickers? I didn't. Hmm, funny. His prints are all over one of those guns we found in your room. I'm not worrying. Well, then you better start, Gannon. Vickers and Knight killed a man. If you run with him, your hands are dirty, too. I room with Knight, that's all. Knight didn't come back to the hotel. Where is he? We're not that close. You share your guns and your friends. That's close enough for us. I don't know Vickers. You mean you didn't know him? I said I don't know him. We got Vickers, Gannon. He's dead. Good story. Okay. Come on, Gannon. Let's go down to the morgue. Down this way, Joe. Cold today, isn't it? Yeah, it's damp. Bad sinus weather. Mm -hmm. What is all this? Never seen a corpse before? No, I'm not in this. Take me back. I don't want to look. You can close your eyes. Take me back. I don't want to look. Here we are, fellas. Slam 45. This way, Gannon. I, I get sick. I don't want to look. Throw back the sheet, Fred. <sighs> Take a no. good look, Gannon. No, he's Knight's friend. I'm not in it. Who is in it? I don't know. I... Take me out. I'm sick. All right, Fred. Thanks. Okay, bye. Interrogation room, Friday. Joe, on stakeout at the Silver Dollar Hotel. No sign of Raymond Knight. Keep you posted. Okay, Dave, thanks. How long does this go on? I can call a lawyer, you know. And you better call one right away, Gannon. They just picked up Knight at the hotel. He's incriminated you. You're a liar. Sure. 
Like we were about Vicker. We'll prove it to you, Gannon. The officers are on their way in now. They're going to put Knight in the next room. You can listen to him. Look, I came here to sell watches. I ain't in this. Gannon, you and Vickers and Knight were planning a job, a big one. We know that. If you want to wait till you get on the witness stand to tell your story, it's all right with us. Well, didn't take too long to break this one. Smoke, Joe? Yeah. Thanks. Gannon? Smoke? Hmm. What are you going to do? Nothing. Just kill a little time. They bring in Knight. You haven't got night. I haven't unwrapped them yet, Joe. You want to check me out? Okay, open them up. Mm-hmm. Give them a good shuffle, huh? You're going to have some time on your hands, Gannon. Want to learn a new card game? No. Nah. Suit yourself. It's a good game for two. Better with three. Sure, a lot of cards. Yeah. You got two decks there. First off, this game is quite a bit like gin rummy. Yeah? There are eight of every suit. Four jokers. Jokers count 50 points. Mm Mm-hmm. Red threes count 100 points each. If you get a black three, you can freeze the deck. I see. I shouldn't say deck. In this game, they call it the pack. Pack? What's a pack? Well, it's the discard pile. Same as in gin. You get a red three, you can freeze it. No, it's a black three. Well, what happens when you freeze it? Nobody can pick it up. Oh, I see. All right. Let's deal out a dummy hand here. Fine game, Gannon. Sure you won't change your mind? We don't want to play, Joe. All right, now I'm two-handed. You deal out 15 cards, see? How many can play? As many as six, I think. I've only played up to four. You play partners with four? Yeah, that's right. Okay, count your cards. I think that's 15. Mm-hmm. 13, 14, 15. Right, now, now what do I do? Well, I guess you better lay your hand open. That'll be the easiest way to show you. Okay. Now spread them all out over there. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't have a great hand there. You got a couple of black threes. You can use those. Yeah, that's fine. They count 100 apiece. No, no, no. Those are red threes. Black threes don't count anything. Oh, red threes. That's right. Do you remember what black threes are for? You can use them to freeze a pile. Pack. That's right. The pack. Well, you know what I mean. All right, now, look. You see, I got a joker here. Jokers are wild. Do you remember how much they count? They're wild. 100 points. No, red threes are worth 100. Jokers count 50. You don't explain it very good. I don't understand. Well, how simple can it be? Gannon's not even playing. You get it, don't you, Gannon? Okay, red threes count 100. Jokers count 50. Black threes, you can fi- you can freeze the, pi- uh, the pack. Yeah, good. Now, hold on to that, will you? Now, black... Black threes freeze the pack, but that's not the only card that can do it. No? No. Deuces can do the same thing. But you see, the only difference is if you use a deuce, which is also wild, you have to have a natural pair in order to pick up the pack. Now, with a black three, it's I knew it. good until... I knew it wouldn't work. It was sour right from the start. Vickers killed the cop. Ben, I'm not in it. I'm right, coming on. I'm taking no raps. Johnny, the stenographer. Right, Ben. All right, Gannon. Too late. You haven't got time. 20 after 1, they're going to do it. Do what? Payroll. Brazier Company. Messenger leaves at 120. He's got the payroll. 30 grand. They're going to get him. Where does the messenger leave? 120. You're too late. I'm not in it. Where does he leave? 120 leaves the bank, I think. No, maybe the company. Where's the company? Third and Spring. They're going to get him. Where's the bank the messenger goes to? Up the block, Second National, Third and Hill. Where are they going to get the messenger? By the alley, Clay Street. I'm not in it. Ben, check it. Get out of communications. Have him put out a call to block off the area. Give him the details. All right. Johnny. Yeah, Joe. Stay with this guy. Okay. Davis. Davis. Let's go. Brazier. Brazier. Brazier Manufacturing. Olympia. Afternoon, Brazier Manufacturing Company. Give me your payroll division. This is a police department emergency. Oh, what's that, sir? Your payroll division. It's an emergency. One moment, sir. Come on, hurry up. Payroll, Hopkins. Mr. Hopkins, this is Sergeant Friday, police department. We've had a tip your payroll messenger is going to be held up today. Has he left your building yet? The messenger? Yeah. Oh, my, he left early today. Went out the door about ten minutes ago. Thanks. Second National, Second National Security. Second National. Let's roll to three. Friday, what's all the excitement? Your brakes head guy? Explain in a minute, Ed. No time. Mm. Good afternoon, Second National. Give me the manager on duty, please. Emergency. One moment, please. One moment. Come on, come on. 
I'm sorry, sir. The line is busy. Would you care to wait? Give me the chief teller. Thank you. Chief Teller, Warner. This is Sergeant Friday, Police Department. Emergency call. Has the payroll messenger from the Brazier Company left the bank yet? Well, uh, I wouldn't know, Sergeant. Uh, just a moment. I'll have your call switched. Yeah. Operator. Beatrice, would you give this call to Miss Chalmers? Uh, it's important. Thank you, Mr. Waters. Miss Chalmers, good afternoon. Miss Chalmers, what's the matter, Freddy? Are you sick? Yeah, I'm sick. Miss Chalmers, good afternoon. Miss Chalmers is a sergeant, Friday, Police Department. Has the payroll messenger from the Brazier Company left the bank yet? From Brazier's? Why, yes, not more than two or three minutes ago. And he had the payroll with him? Of course. Thanks. Got a tip on a payroll stick. I bet you coming. Yeah, hey, let's go. Ben, down this way. Coming. Let's hustle it down the stairs. Communications, get the story. You got it on the air now. Where's this Brazier Company? Third and Spring, about five blocks from here. Come on, here's the garage. All right, come on, hit it. Let's make time. Get the radio on. Just warming up. All units. Attention all units. On 3rd Street, corner of Clay Alley, 211. A bank messenger. Suspects are headed west on Clay Alley. Suspects are armed. Code 3. 11R. Take the call. Cars are closing in fast. Fourth Street up ahead, Ben. Might meet him at this end of Clay Alley. Hold on. No, looks pretty quiet at this end. Not much you can do without... Hey, hey, look. Coming out of the alley now. Guy with the police. Brown coat. The guy with him. Pull up, Ben. Now let's go. All right, you two, hold it. They're running for it. Come on. Ben, what's this bus? Let's go. Come on, they're losing it. I see him up ahead. They're turning on the Hill Street. Romero, come on. Will you, Skipper? You see him, Joe? Heading for the subway terminal. Yeah, they're going into the crowd. Don't lose them. All right, I'll take the ramp to the left. Then go with him. I'll take the one to the right. You see him, Joe? No, I lost. Now, wait a minute. There they are. Over the turnstile. Come on. Joe, Joe, they're off the platform. They're crossing the tracks. Ed's got one of them. Come on, over the turnstile. Come on. Joe, the other gun. He's down into the tunnel. He's crazy. Come on, after him. Hug the side. He's trapped, Ben. There's a train coming through. You, come back. You're trapped. Ben, get out. Hug the side. You all right, Joe? Yeah. Yeah, you? Mm-hmm. You want to check? No, I don't think it's any use. Yeah. Well, let's go. I wonder why he tried so hard, Joe. I don't know, Ben. Some people are like that. You can blow the whistle all you want. They never know when to stop. <laughs> Frank Gannon, the only surviving member of the holdup gang, was tried and convicted of the crime of assault with intent to commit murder. He is now serving out his sentence at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 16th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Private Richard H. Taylor of the Washington, D.C. Police Department, who on the evening of December 13th, 1946, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. Phil Harris likes a great deal about the South. We like a great deal about Phil Harris. For instance, we like his beautiful blonde wife, Alice Faye. In fact, we like the Phil Harris Alice Faye show, and it just happens that it returns to the NBC air tomorrow. Why don't you take our advice and listen to one of the funniest shows around anywhere? That's the Phil Harris Alice Faye show tomorrow on most of these same NBC stations. <laughs> the stars on NBC.
ABC. So, how did you find that episode? Great episode, originally from Dragnet uh, in 1949, and a great homage that we played today for Robert Mitchum, one of one of the most underrated leading men of um, in Hollywood, I would say. Um, fantastic, talented actor, always looking quite nonchalant. Um, fantastic actor, although he started out life. Resenting authority, leading to lots of problems in his school years and teen adventures. He discovered acting in California through theatre. And after working various roles, made it up, up the way to some legendary roles, including Charles Lawton's Night of the Hunter. As well as being a writer and producer as well. Moving into TV and war films, he's really had a breadth of uh, talent. And I would highly recommend checking him out online for some of the films that he's made. Thank you, as always, for watching us today on Classic Radio. If you have any comments about Robert Mitchum, who's your favourite actor, role that he's played, what sort of TV show or film you love the most about him, please do drop a note below. Thank you always for watching us. Thank you for supporting us. Please watch all our episodes. Get us, especially on the newer newer episodes we're doing where we do intros to other, other actors. Give us some feedback. Please do let us know what you like, what you don't like about our new format. And thank you for watching as always. It's Louis B here saying happy holidays, signing off. And we'll see you on the next episode. Bye for now. Take care.